Good morning. We have a lot to be thankful for as we gather together for worship. It is, if not already, springtime. We we now in a, a time of year where the we're getting ready for graduation week. VBS week starts just seven days from the day. And then amongst all of this, it is also Memorial Day week and a time for us to slow down to step back and give appreciation for those who served and gave a sacrifice for the freedoms that we enjoy. And we thank God for these blessings, for the love shown to us by others, some we know and some we have never met. And so as we come together this day, remembering the freedom we have in this life, but the freedom from sin that was also won for us through Christ, we think of what Paul wrote to the Romans from one of my favorite, if not my favorite chapter of scripture, Romans chapter 8. He starts off by saying, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for our sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So we thank God for what he has done for us. And we follow him faithfully by walking in the spirit. And as we seek to do so, I invite you, if you're willing, if you're able, please rise. Let's greet and welcome one another as we worship together this day. Oh, you are 
Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the grace that you have shown us that we can only stand before you faultless because of what Christ has done, that he is taking that sin and guilt upon himself so that we might come to know your love and forgiveness. Help us, O oh Lord, to trust in you, to recognize you for the rock you are in our lives, our solid point in a world that is shaky. 
Give us faith beyond understanding. Help us through the gift of your Holy Spirit to follow you, to serve you, to find our calling in life and where we fit in this journey of faith. Thank you, Lord, for all you do in our lives. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So it's VBS week and or we're a week out, it's time for preparations. And just to help us to kind of understand a few things and, and recognize what's coming up and what still needs to happen, uh, Corey and Audrey have uh, a little bit to share with us this morning. Let's see. Um, if we have a bunch of fish over there and a sunken ship over there, hmm. No, I really I think it's going to be best. Well, check back here. Maybe it would be best over there. Gosh, there's a whoa! What's going on? Put your hands up where I can see them. All right. I got a scuba poster and I know how to use it. What are you doing wearing all of that? Corey, it's me. What? What are you doing? Getting ready for VBS. You said it was called scuba, so I thought I'd start getting ready. You told me we'd be diving into friendship with God. Yeah, but... VBS doesn't start until next Sunday, June 2nd, right? Pretty sure that's right. And I don't think you need a snorkel. It's going to be pretty hard leading the recreation with flippers on. Well, that's a fine kettle of fish. So what do I need? Just bring your sense of your... Boy, I can talk. Bring your sense of fun and adventure. Our church is going to be swimming with kids. And they're all coming to dive into friendship with God. So don't be crabby. Wow, I'm under pressure now. Ah, don't worry. You'll be as happy as a clam. So before the oceans of fun gets rolling, can you give me a hand hanging this poster up? Sure, but maybe I should lose the flippers. Definitely. So if you missed the key date in there, June 2nd, next Sunday, VBS starts. There is still a sign-up sheet on the Welcome Center um, out of the main doors of the sanctuary. If you're able to help out throughout that week, even if it's just for a day or two, we're having a steady rolling of kids signing up. So that's always exciting as we get a couple or a few each, each day. Um, if you're not able to help out, there are still ways to pray over the weekend to, or the weekend to help uh, just cover and bathe this whole opportunity with prayer and preparation. And I know uh, this upcoming Saturday at 10 in the morning, there'll be a, a time of decoration to get ready for VBS. So if you're able to make it, that'll be at the Ark Center this Saturday at 10 a.m. So thank you for your ongoing support. It's almost here and we are very excited for this time together. Also, uh, there, just as we continue through our series and talk about some of these different aspects of our mission and vision and some of these strategic mission priorities, uh, you'll notice there's an announcement in your bulletin about the a team realignment and what we're looking for are some volunteers to be a part of some of these uh, guidance teams or oversight teams. And so I ask that you just take some time to read through there and prayerfully um, consider whether that's an opportunity you'd be willing to serve in. And if so, uh, there are connection cards in your pews that you can either fill out or use the, the QR code to go online. Just fill that out and uh, let us know that you're willing to do that. And if you fill it out by hand, you can just set that in the offering plate. Give us a chance to, to go through and, and fill some of these teams with people to kind of look at the big picture, look at the mission and vision, how it speaks into each area of our ministry. 
But as we come together, as we worship the Lord, it is Family Sunday. And so we want to invite our little ones forward for this morning's children's message. Good morning. Uh, I know some of you are out of school. That means you're still tired? Let's try that again. Good morning. Uh, You know, I wouldn't give a very good grade on that either. (laughs) Tell these people out there that you're happy to be in church by saying really loud, good morning. They're afraid now. (laughs) Okay. Well, I'm going to test your memory. A month ago, Miss Corey was up here. She did this sermon. Anybody remember what you talked about? Oh, a whole month away. What's Pastor been talking about? Oh, boy. We got to get our brains working this morning. Do you remember, Corey, t- having you throw some candy? Yeah. What did she want to tell you to do? Were you. S- Go ahead. She wanted you to go out into the world and preach the good news to everyone, right? Well, we're going to go on to that a little bit, and we're going to work with that. But I'm going to need some help. I got two chairs here, so I need two volunteers. I'm afraid you're too tall. (laughs) I'm sorry, it's great to be tall, but I got little kids' chairs. Emma, we'll give you a try. Maybe a little short. Come sit in the chair anyway. You want to come sit in the chair, Emma? And give us a try. We're going to play a little game here. Yeah, you're going to be a little short. (laughs) And if you want to try sitting on the floor, you can. It might not work as well. Okay. I'm going to tell you some directions. And you need to follow them. All right. So are you sitting straight in your chair? Sit straight and make sure your back is against the back. And you, you're, and you're not going to be able to put your feet on the floor, are you, Emma? But that's okay. Put your feet. Can you put your feet flat on the floor? Close enough. I got some short people here today. All right. So now, I want you to place your finger on your nose. Okay. Now, nod your head up and down if you love God. We got some knots. Okay, now you can take your finger off your nose. Can you blink your eyes three times? All right. Now I want you to cross your arms like this and show me how much you love God. Okay, now with your back straight against there and your hands like that. Don't take your hands down. I want you to stand up. Oh, back. You got to stay against the back. Can you stand straight up? Uh Uh-oh, they're stuck, aren't they? They can't get up. You may put your hands down a minute. Okay, we'll help. We're going to let them sit on that chair a minute. Okay? They're going to listen while they're sitting on that chair. Well, did you know that there are people like that that are stuck? Yeah. God calls people to serve. And sometimes they get stuck like these two. Can't get up and move because they might be afraid. Some believe, ha ha, I can't do it, even though God asked me to. All right? But did you know God wants us to be willing to follow him? Tell people about him? Anytime, any place anywhere 
Listen to this verse in the Bible. Anyone who wants to follow me must put aside his own desires and conveniences and carry his cross with him wherever, every day and keep close to me. So what do you think he's saying? That we gotta put away our desires, our excuses, our wants, and every day do, do what God wants us to do, and that is what? What does God want us to do every day? What did Corey tell you? Spread the good news, right. Okay, so we're gonna talk about, Corey says we're supposed to do that, pastor says we're supposed to spread the good, how do we, we're little, we're not gonna get up here and preach a sermon, are we? So we do it by our actions and our words. So tell me, how could you spread the good news with your actions? Any idea? How about in school? How could you spread the good news with your actions? Say it again. To act like God, and how do you do that? That's a good Good, but how do I do that? How many of you, and I don't see too many right now, smile at people? Do you ever walk by somebody, and even though you don't know them, and you smile? They're a smile. Right. How about if you see somebody having a bad day? Do you ever give, go up and give them a hug? There's one that does. How about we try very hard to do something and we didn't do it very well? And you know that person. Do you ever go up and say, give them a pat on the back and say, you did a good job. Maybe it's a race and you didn't win it, but you tried hard. Do you ever go up to somebody and say it's a good job? Yeah, there are many ways we can do things like that, right? How about with our mouth, what we say? How do we, how can we do that? How can we serve God by our mouth? Oh, we are on vacation already, aren't we? And no idea? Anybody ever tells a friend in school about what they've done in Sunday school? What you learn in Sunday school? Ever done that? That's a one way to spread the good news. Ever see a beautiful rainbow or a bird? You saw a rainbow. Did you ever tell your mom or somebody, your friend, that, hey, did you see that rainbow that God made? Good. That's one way. Do you got another? Right. You know, that's a God thing. We can tell God people about those beautiful things God has shown us or helped us with. How many of you go and say I love you to somebody and you say that, do you ever say I love Jesus to your friends? Okay, remember, you go to school, you go to daycare. Yeah, so remember, yeah, you got friends there. Do you ever tell them about Jesus? Remember, anywhere, any place, anytime, every day, you're supposed to tell people about Jesus and serve him. Okay, I got these two stuck on the chair. We're gonna pray, and then we're going to get them out of their chairs, and then you may grab a piece of candy, all right? So let's bow our heads and pray, all right? Dear Lord Jesus, you gave us that command to go serve you no matter what. And we do are to do that every day, every place, everywhere. Lord, we're little, and that should be, we're still required to do that. Help us to voice our love for you wherever we go, whoever we see. Lord, you are an awesome God, and we have so much to be thankful for that you give us. We ask that you watch over us and care about us and keep us safe. We pray this in your name. Amen. Okay.
Now, you two, put your hands back up. Cross your hands like this. Remember how we had our... Like we looked up? Okay, you know how you get off your chair? You gotta bend forward. Now stand up. I bet you can get up. Yeah, so you may get your candy. Now go serve the Lord. This morning, we're continuing our series, Like Jesus, where we've been looking at our, our mission and our vision and, and then these uh, strategic uh, mission priorities we have as a church in order to live out that mission and vision. And so if you look in your bulletin this morning, there are notes if you choose to fill those in and follow along as we go. But as we start off, let's center our hearts and our thoughts in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example we have in Jesus of what it means to live this life faithfully. And when we talk about this, this mission and vision to, to reach one more for Christ, to, to live as missionaries to our local community, that you would help us in these things, that we would be able to, to open up your word and see the example that Jesus set in each of these matters and that we would have it in our hearts and our minds and our actions that we are going to follow faithfully in these things. For you have called us to them. Lord, it's hard at times to, to do what we know we should. That we can clearly see what you have called us into, but there's distractions, there's, there's getting the energy each day. So we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to help us to get excited about what you are leading us into. Lord, guide us in this time. Help us to understand your word and give us hearts the desire to live these things out. In your name, amen. There's a, a good question raised in the children's message of, of what it means to live like God. And in a sense, that's what we're seeing in, this, in these mission priorities, these, these strategic mission priorities of what it's like to live like Jesus. And this morning we come to the second one of these, which is to serve. Now, last Sunday, which feels like forever ago already, um, but last Sunday we took a break from our series to celebrate Pentecost, and we saw how the Holy Spirit filled the disciples. For we do need the guidance of the Holy Spirit if we are going to faithfully follow God's direction for us as the people of God. And now we come to, again to the second of these strategies of our God-given vision of being missionaries to our local community. And as we've said already, it's to serve like Jesus. The first was to love like Jesus. Now we're looking at what it means to serve like Jesus. And really, if we look through, if you read through the Gospels and see uh, Jesus' ministry, his time teaching the disciples, there is example after example of Jesus demonstrating what it looked like to serve. And he especially demonstrated this through what we recognize as the feet washing, washing, which took place during the Passover meal. If you have your Bibles open this morning, I encourage you to turn with us to John chapter 13. We're beginning in the, the start of this chapter um, where we talk about the washing of the feet. Now, we read, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and having taken a towel, he tied around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet 
and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, admittedly, this custom of washing someone's feet or even washing your own feet upon entering a a, a household is something I would imagine that most of us are not all that familiar with. And I'm not accusing anyone here of not washing their feet ever. But what I will say is that this idea that every time we travel somewhere, we're not immediately washing our feet has a part of our routine multiple times a day. But again, things are not the same way they are today as they were during Jesus's day. For instance, travel looked a lot different than what we're accustomed to. For most people, walking from point A to point B meant walking there even, or going from point A to point B meant walking there even if it was a great distance away. You didn't have the vehicles, there was no bus you could take, there were no flights to go see relatives, and they were not walking in nice enclosed pair of shoes either. Instead, most people wore a type of sandal. Now, while that might not sound too bad, keep in mind that they didn't have nice sidewalks to walk on as they were going from where they were at to where they were headed. Walking in sandals on dust and dirt, as you could imagine, left people's feet absolutely filthy from their travels. So it really should not be a surprise to any of us that this foot washing became a regular routine. That as they they walked through these dusty roads, as they walked to places, their feet got dirty and they cleaned them regularly in order to make them clean. They wouldn't necessarily have to wash their whole bodies that much, but their feet got special attention. And so it was customary then upon returning from travel to wash your feet. And it was something that was not everyone did for themselves either. For there were many people who did not wash their own feet. Instead, they had someone from their household wash their feet. Usually what was considered the lowest ranking member. And so if they had servants in their household, whoever was the lowest, lowest or lowliest of the servants was giving this job because nobody wanted to be the one to touch everyone's dirty feet. And I can't speak for you, but I understand this personally. I did not want, I would not volunteer quickly to be that person if I could help it. Washing dirty, sweaty feet's not exactly high on anyone's list of of chores or jobs that they would like to do. But while this task was reserved for those considered lowest in the household, we find here at during the Passover meal, Jesus rising from their meal. And beginning to wash the disciples' feet. And in doing so, he is setting an example of service for them and then ultimately for us to follow. And so if you're following along in your notes this morning, our first point is that Jesus set an example of how to serve with humility. Because that's what we find in the feet washing. That Jesus is serving the disciples. But how he is choosing to serve them is full of humility. Keep in mind who Jesus is. Not just that he is the son of God. But who he is in relation to the disciples. He is their teacher. Or you could say their rabbi. And part of the role of a disciple is to serve to take care of their rabbi. In a sense, they were both to learn from them, but they are also to serve them, take care of their daily needs. Yet Jesus does really the opposite of what one would expect of someone in his role to do. Instead of being served, Jesus humbles himself in service of others. In in service of those that were supposed to be serving him. So washing the disciples' feet, it was truly an act of humility. He willingly took the role of a servant, which is something much larger than just the fact that Jesus was washing the disciples' feet. For let's take a look back one more time here at verse 3. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, 
and that he had come from God and was going back to God. This is the context that we're giving in John, that the true humility of Jesus was doing something, not just because he's a rabbi that was out of his position, but doing something despite the fact that he is Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah. I would imagine that most of us would not enjoy daily life in the ancient world. As much as we might want to go back and meet Jesus, and that would be a wonderful experience, just to live in that world would be a challenge. Life was harder for a variety of reasons. There's a reason why life expectancy has increased over time since that time. That we have luxuries that we are accustomed to. That did not exist back then. And then, of course, you have to consider the question of hygiene practices. Our standard today is so far removed from what people lived with each day 2,000 years ago. It would be a challenge for any of us to go from this life to the life that Jesus lived Yet, he chose to come. Instead of leaving by a few creature comforts that we would have to leave in order to go back in time to live amongst those people, Jesus left behind all the glories of heaven to come to earth. And despite his place of authority, having all things given into his hands, he took upon himself the role of the lowliest servant And quite frankly, this kind of sacrificial service to to others, if it was not below Jesus, if it was not, if Jesus was not too good for this, then it is not beneath either you or I. For we are not better than serving in the lowliest form if Jesus isn't. Everyone who follows Jesus must therefore be a servant. And while we can look back and and see this lesson in Jesus' action for the disciples, they in the moment struggled to catch and to recognize the lesson that was being taught to them in that moment. Because they were bewildered by what was happening. That Jesus was actually washing their feet. We see this in Peter's reaction To Jesus coming and and washing his feet. Picking up in verse 6. It says he came to Simon Peter. Who said to him Lord. Do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him. What I am doing you do not understand now. But afterward you will understand. Peter said to him. You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him. If I do not wash your feet. You have no share with me. Upon Jesus taking this role of a servant, of taking himself to him and preparing to wash Peter's feet, Peter says no. He objects to this idea that Jesus would do this for him. He simply could not understand the depth of the humility of Jesus. In a way, Peter was the one who needed to learn humility in this moment. For while he did not yet understand Why Jesus was taking on this role of a servant. He was willing to be obedient in letting him wash his feet. Despite these objections that he, Peter, had at what was happening. And so serving in Christ's kingdom is not about gaining prestige or the praise of others. In many ways, the opposite is what we tend to see being true. Where serving can make one less popular. For there are many missionaries I feel fit this example. And while none of the missionaries that we're currently supporting are are facing this problem, I know other missionaries that have had to keep their identity a secret out of concern over what the government might do if they find out that they're serving as missionaries in the areas that they have been called to. There's one such ministry couple that comes to mind, and I can't even say their names now because we are live streaming this service. But I'll just say that they're serving in Africa. And I remember uh, our time serving in Illinois. Um, These missionaries, they came to that church, 
and shared about the, the medical ministry that they were a part of. And what really stuck out beyond what they were doing on the mission field were the preparations that had to go into that time. That if bulletins were posted online, they couldn't be posted that week. That during the service, the live stream had to be cut before they went up to speak. Nothing on social media could have their names, nor could it be on the website. All this fear was out there because if word got out to the country they were serving, there was a good chance that they would not renew their visa, that they would not be allowed to re-enter the country, and their work amongst that people group would be ended, not because of their choice, but because of those officials that had say over who could or could not enter that region. But here's the thing. They were doing good work. But working in secret for the sake of the gospel is not exactly going to make anybody famous. But again, serving like Jesus is not about the recognition. Service is not about what you can earn or achieve. Jesus set the example, humbling himself to take a role that culturally would be considered beneath him. Enough so that his own disciples had issues with his role he was taken. It is out of our love for God then and, and the gratitude we have for the grace of Jesus that we follow suit. Taking roles that, that we might consider beneath us culturally, however, they are where we are called to be because we're following the example of Jesus. Because even with the best of intentions... Serving out of humility does not come naturally to everyone. That it takes some level of practice and intentionality. And so that brings us to the second point in our notes this morning. Which is that serving with humility means setting your pride aside. That these two aspects of your life are in conflict with one another another that humility is in conflict with pride for where there is too much pride it is hard to remain humble now there's a reason why pride is listed amongst what we consider the seven deadly sins because pride is a common problem and it has seeped into our culture at large even the disciples, the ones that were following Jesus and learning from him, had their struggles with pride. Take, for example, something that happened during the, this Last Supper, which shows why the disciples needed Jesus' example of servant leadership. We're turning to the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. This is what we're reading in verse 24. It says, A dispute also arose among them, talking about the disciples, as to which of them was regarded as the greatest. After years of following Jesus, after learning firsthand from his example, the disciples were still not immune to their own disputes. While we often consider the Last Supper to be a somber occasion, here are the disciples squabbling over which of them would be considered greatest. And to be honest, it's hard for any of us to put too much blame on them. Comparisons and making comparisons is ingrained as part of who we are. You know, I, I admit that up until the last like four days, it has been fun watching the Timberwolves do well into the playoffs. And then I really just want to forget what's happened the last couple of games and we'll move on from that. Because it's been 20 years since they've done anything worth mentioning, which is crazy to believe. It's nice for things to finally start coming together. But one of the reasons why the Timberwolves, if you don't watch basketball, have had success is they have this young 22-year-old player named Anthony Edwards. He, he's a superstar in the making. But one thing I've noticed is that after that first series where they swept Phoenix and then going and winning the first two games like they did against the Denver Nuggets, if you, if you watch any of the clips of the broadcast media talking about the Timberwolves, they have this tendency of trying to compare him to people that have come before. 
They're saying, oh, he kind of looks like a young Michael Jordan or he looks like a young Dwayne Wade type player. People love to make comparisons and to measure people against each other. It happens in sports all the time, but it happens elsewhere as well. It happens in the workplace. I remember in college, I, I worked on nights after class and then on Saturdays as well in customer service for a, for a large bank. And that was not a fun job, but it helped get me through college. And I remember that they kept a rank of employee performance. And not only did they have a spreadsheet that ranked everybody, but they actually made banners. And so the top three people got a banner above their desk so everyone could notice who is doing better than you. This is the person you're chasing after. Even in churches, people make comparisons. People compare churches all the time. And quite honestly, it tends to be done in a poor way. Usually when churches are compared against one another, it's how many members do you have on Sunday morning? Yet as a body of believer, that, believers, that's not the measure of a healthy church. The true measure of how we're doing as a congregation is whether or not we are doing God's will. Notice that measure of success is not based upon what anyone else is doing. It is not about how we're doing compared to someone else. Because the measure of faithfulness is not a certain number of people, nor is it comparing to what someone else is doing. It's a matter of living out God's will. And despite this, there seems to be something in our nature that leads us to compare what we are doing to everyone else. And when, we, and when it manifests itself, it can show your heart to be in the wrong place. This is what we see in the disciples. That even at the Last Supper, they were too worried about personal recognition. And they needed this rebuke by Jesus. So as we continue in Luke 22. And he, Jesus now speaking to them, says in verse 25, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become the youngest, and the leader has one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at the table or one who serves? It is not the one who reclines at the table, but I am among you as the one who serves." Jesus is comparing the disciples' actions to that of the kings of the Gentiles. For this dispute over who was greatest amongst them was a matter of chasing after the things the people of this world who don't know God chase after. All authority was given to Jesus from, from our Heavenly Father. Yet instead of lauding that title over others, he, in, he instead took on the role of a servant by washing the disciples' feet and then facing the cross on our behalf. Jesus' words and more importantly, his actions at the Last Supper were meant to teach the disciples lessons for when he was gone so that they would be willing not to squabble over who was greatest, but to choose to serve one another. As we return to the Gospel of John, turning back to chapter 13, we pick up now to what was being taught here in verse 12. For Jesus, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. After washing the disciples' feet and setting this example, Jesus speaks and he attacks the pride and self-importance that was still present in the disciples. 
While they were fighting over who was greatest, Jesus modeled for them what being great really means. For if Jesus did not consider himself too important to serve the disciples, neither are they too important to serve one another. And so what we come to find then is the final point in our notes this morning. Is that the call to service is universal. The call to service is universal. Jesus told the disciples to do as he had done to them. He served them without regard for his own pride. He served them without regard to his own status in life. And they were to do likewise. This call to service, it is universal, meaning that it is for everyone. Nobody is too important to serve. All are called to serve. Do what you can, when you can, to serve one another. Sometimes life hits you hard and you're in a place where you need to be one willing to allow others to speak that service into your life. And we need to be willing to accept the help of others. We don't want to be as stubborn as Peter. For that's not a permanent state. One is not meant to only receive. We accept the help of others and encouragement of others while at the same time following the example of Jesus and serving others how we can when we can. And there are many ways to serve others. Some of this will be in daily life and how you can share in the love of Christ with those around you. And there's also numerous ways to serve through church, which is, is intentional. For our gifts vary. The call to service is to everyone. The things that we do as a church only happen because people are willing to step up and serve. Beyond the opportunities to serve within the congregation, we look for opportunities to serve within the community through our partnership with other ministries such as Love, Inc. or Operation Christmas Child. We also have the the Linen Closet. OCC is a major area of service. And there's other ways that we have partnered and looked to partner to be helpful and to support the good work already happening By God's people. And in years to come, we will continue to find ways to serve, especially within our community. But again, this call to service is for everyone. There's something each of us can do, including praying for and supporting the work of others. If you haven't already, I encourage you, find a place to serve. Both within the church, but also in the community around you. And if you need help If you'd like help figuring out where that might be. Again, we have those connection cards in the pews. We have the technology part with the QR code if you're more of a phone person. But there's a chance to fill it out. Put in the collection plate. Connect with us saying you're looking to serve. We can help you find a place if you're not already plugged in. Because Jesus gave us an example. Not just at the feet washing, but also at the cross. When he took upon himself a punishment that was not his. It's so now, it is up to us. It's up to you to follow this example of service. And as we seek to do so, let's pray for God's help. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of service that we have in Jesus. The fact that he was humble himself and served those around him. Oh, Lord, you are good to us. Help us to be willing to follow this example. Help us to set aside our pride, our self-righteousness in the name of following and being faithful to you. Let us listen to the word of the Holy Spirit speaking to our lives. That way we might allow you to lead us in service and not be self-seeking, but kingdom-minded. We flounder in these things, O Lord. Help us to faithfully follow you. Especially this weekend, we also come together as your people and we remember. We remember those who served. We remember the freedom that we have and the price that was paid for it. So we thank you for those who have come, who have made a sacrifice for the benefit of others. Many, most of which they never knew. But they did it out of love and service. 
Help us, Lord, not to forget what was done on our behalf. We ask your blessing to be upon uh, either this transition into summer for those who have already completed their school term or a blessing on this last week for those that are still in school that they could finish well. And especially as we look forward to the VBS and that time of coming together and, and learning about having a relationship with you. We ask your blessing to be on that time that, that you would already be working in the hearts of those that are volunteering, that you'd be working in the hearts of the kids that come. That this would be done in a way that glorifies you and helps people understand who you are and, and come to know you as Lord and Savior. We ask you to be at work in the, in the weather. We know in many ways that it's hard to figure out exactly what we need in terms of weather, but we know that um, in some instances we've gotten too much of some things and not enough of another. And so I ask, especially for the farmers that are still trying to, to get things planted, that you would bring them what they need in order for this year's planting and harvest to go, um, to go well. And sometimes we just have to say, Lord, we trust you. And we ask you to work what is needed. As we come together as your people, as we gather, as we pray, we know that you are at work in this world. Help us to see where we can serve. Help us to notice where the need is at. Show us through your spirit the gifts that you have given us for, the, for your work here on this earth. That way we may follow faithfully. And we especially ask you in this time to lift up those who are in times of healing and recovery. We think of Sherry as she has this knee scope and, and we ask that you be with her. She looks to what lies ahead. And we think of Alicia as she's recovering from this emergency C-section. And thank you for the healing that she's already had in that process. And Paula as she recovers from wrist surgery. And for Phyllis as they look ahead to what options lie before her. And we think of Zachary and uh, his continuing physical therapy, but we're also grateful that he has recovered from this allergic reaction. And, and while that was scary, we thank you for seeing him through that time. Please also be with others who are dealing with ailments and injuries and possibilities of surgeries coming up, whether it's wrists or knees that ache or pain or, or other challenges in their life. Give them endurance. Uh, we ask that there would be good possibilities medically to help them with what they have and that you would strengthen them in the meantime as they await this healing. We also especially think of those who are fighting cancer. We know there's Jaime and, and Pastor Irwin and Randy and Scott and Roxanne and we ask your, your healing hands to lay upon them but also be upon those who are not listed that they too would be healed, would be guided, would be strengthened and encouraged by your work. Thank you that despite the challenges of this life, whether it's hardships we face, whether it's medical concerns, whether it's broken relationships, you are there, that you never lead us, that you help us in the darkest and hardest of times, for we are never alone. For all you do in this world, O oh Lord, we don't, we don't give you enough. We don't serve you enough. We don't love you enough. But we do what we can. Send your spirit. Help us to be faithful. And Lord, as we come together as your people, united now with those unable to worship with us regularly, that we offer to you this prayer that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. However is most comfortable for you, whether you prefer to sit or stand, I invite you to sing with us as we praise our Lord once again through song.
As we prepare to see this morning's blessing, I invite you to, to raise your hands. Much as we bless, we receive that blessing. And so now, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. May you always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is never in vain. Amen. Amen.